like to introduce you to Gisela Ferrer. Uh, Gisela is our president of the Wild Ones New Jersey Gateway Chapter, and she will be the one who will introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Don Torino. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, I would like to welcome all the uh, native gardeners, uh, flora and fauna enthusiasts, land stewards, concerned citizens, friends and family. I wish to uh, welcome everyone. Uh, tonight, we're making history as Wild Ones New Jersey Gateway hosts its very first educational webinar. We are so excited about this webinar and we uh, couldn't have been more happy to have Mr. Don Torino join us. Uh, again, my name is Gisela Ferrer. I'm a lifelong learner who is passionate about plants, animals, and about uh, saving the planet. I think we should all uh, kind of be uh, on, on that uh, level um, of um, wanting to help and save the planet. Uh, I am also the president and one of the five founding board members. Wild Ones is a national nonprofit organization that has over 100 chapters in 29 states. Its mission is focused on promoting environmentally sound landscaping practices to preserve biodiversity through the preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. Please visit wildones.org to learn more about our national organization, its mission, and its accomplishments. Wild Ones um, New Jersey Gateway serves six counties in, Gar in the Garden State. That's Passaic, Bergen, Hudson, Essex, Union, and Middlesex. Our goal is to develop and support these communities by having educational webinars such as this one, demonstration gardens, events, native plant sales, field trips, hikes, and more. We, uh, you can help uh, magnify our efforts through your support as a member or a volunteer. Please consider supporting us as a, uh, for a more resilient tomorrow. And now let me introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Don Torino. He is a native New Jerseyan and the president of the Bergen County Audubon Society. He is also the author of the book, Life in the Meadowlands, have right here, wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and um, I highly recommend it. Uh, it is beautifully written. It is a light read that provides a view of the Meadowlands, the natural world, and some of today's ecological challenges. You can check the chat uh, for the link to purchase the book. Get ready to have Mr. Torino inspire us to be better land stewards. Please welcome Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Don Torino. I keep referring to him as doctor because he is so knowledgeable. Mr. <laughs> Don Torino, thank you for being here tonight. Oh, thank you, you so are, much. You are and, a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much and thank you for the uh, invitation. Much appreciated. Uh, you know, of all the uh, programs that I do and give, and I, I give a lot of them everything from subject of eagles to um to bird watching beginners bird watching uh this is my favorite uh program to do uh and um you'll find out why so let me uh try to share my screen here hopefully that'll work and there we go nope there we go got it yeah i think we you know do we yeah but do you see that okay not yet don we haven't seen oh. it okay uh for some reason let me see what is going on here. Let me try it again. Huh. I, oh, looks like it. There we go. We uh, see it. All right. So let me uh, do this. All right. How's that go? Yeah. Good. All right. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, let me just start by talking a little about, about who we are at Bergen County Audubon Society. So uh, we're the local chapter of the National Audubon Society. And even though we're called Bergen County Audubon Society, our jurisdiction now uh, is in most uh, Hudson County, Passaic County, and even into Morris County. So uh, our organization is over 80 years old. Um, so we figured it's too late to change our name now. So, um, and but, but we're very proud of that. So uh, again, we're all volunteers and um, 
we have everybody can join us at, at any time. So creating a certified wildlife garden. So this is, like I said, this is the most important thing that we can do. And we do a lot of work at Bergen County Audubon from protecting and monitoring endangered species um, to uh, doing uh, joint work with uh, the DEP and so many other programs. But this one is the one that I feel uh, is the most important and, and most important thing that we all of us can do together. Every backyard is important, and I know I'm probably preaching to the choir, but uh, you know, and especially here in New Jersey, we we've certainly you know the the most uh, 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 densely populated state, um, but also in one of the most uh, amazing uh, uh, migratory bird areas along that Atlantic Flyway probably in the country. Um, but anybody that's grown up here and as a Meadowlands kid, we certainly saw a lot of changes uh, over the years. So why, why did we start the program? Well, you know, we, we kind of knew uh, what we had to do. We, we, we knew that um, what we did in our backyard was, was tied uh, really to the rest of the world. Uh, and, and, but we, we, for years, we kind of went back and forth on actually how, how we should do what we should do and, and how we should bring that message out. And then, um, a few years back, one of our volunteers was, uh, tagging monarch butterflies in, in his yard in, in Palisades Park. And a few days later, some of those butterflies showed up in our, uh, education director's home in Hackensack, and, and Marie is uh, actually with us today. And um, and we knew it was that butterfly because we knew where the numbers were and 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 how to track it. So that that's when we really knew and understood how important every yard was. That really brought it home for us because what, what happened in between those yards in Palisades Park and Hackensack, which is not, not you know, a few miles away, but you know, would they have made it? Would they have continued on that migration route if it wasn't for the yard that Marie had with the native plant? So then we knew that we really have to have to bring this home and how and uh, how important that it was. And uh, also, by the way, one of the uh, monarchs that Marie tagged uh, last year in her yard actually showed up in Delaware. Um, so that that the areas that that butterfly used from Hackensack down to Delaware more than likely depended on a lot of, uh, definitely depended on native plants, but definitely uh, probably depended on individuals creating these uh, these gardens. Now, the wood thrush is, is a great example. Anybody that grew up loving birds or spent any time in the wood, woods knows the magic song of the wood thrush, but they also know that that song has been dying out in, in many, many places. And, uh, you know, why is that? Well, look at the, look, you could check out that migration route and you could see that where it, where it spends the winters in, in Central America and the areas that it comes back to in the spring to breed are really interconnected with each other. And they're really dependent on unbroken, unbroken forest. But we see what's been happening in that fragmentation uh, over the years. And you could see at the decline, the sad decline that the wood thrushes have. And this is really just an example of, of many neotropical birds that we have been losing. 55% decline over the past 50 years. And 41% of all our neotropical birds have been declining. And, and really for this reason. And, and look, that, that's what's happened in those areas where many of the areas where the wood thrush used, used to breed. Um, and, and you know, now it, that, that urban area, it, that area has turned to lawn. And the plants in those urban areas, 80% non-native. So it, it, it could be pretty, and, and you take a look at this in uh, uh, how the housing density uh, will look by 2030. It's um, kind of scary. But we've also lost, <laughs> just to give you some more bad news, 2.9 billion birds since 1970. And again, anybody that's grown up anywhere 
really uh, have seen a decline. You're not seeing the birds that that we used to. Uh, and and you know why is that? It all really comes down to habitat. And let's bring that like right home, right right to where we are. So you know, New Jersey's become fragmented, right? Isolated or quilt work of native habitats. And so the idea of this program really is to create those stepping stones between those habitats and connect those fragments as best. Look, I can't, um, I wish I could buy up, you know, houses and, and then come down and create more habitat, uh, but we can't. But what we can do, what we can do is, is change the landscaping in those backyards to to create better habitat. So if you have a favorite nature center, right? If you love the celery farm, or if you love anywhere, you love uh, Way Way Hunter State Park, um, you want to expand those areas? Well, you know, can't not buy up all the property around it, but you can change the landscaping around those areas to actually expand those areas to help our birds and butterflies and pollinators. And you want to you know, climate change is, you know, is the big one, right? Uh, no matter what we do, uh, that's always going to come back as, as the number one issue. Well, you want to relieve the stresses on migratory birds today, like now, you know, plant native plants is the best way you could relieve that stress on, on, uh, on, on, on from climate change uh, almost immediately. And of course, it creates a healthier place, you know, for all of us. It isn't only about the wildlife. In the end, it's really about where we live and how we live and and and, and our quality of life also. And now we're over 201, we might hit 201 um, certified wildlife gardens. Uh, and we're all ready out to places like Missouri and of course, New York State, Pennsylvania. So we're taking this uh, all over the place. And look, this is all this is all free. This isn't kind of any money making idea or anything like that. We made sure that we implemented this. We were going to certify you get a sign, get the whole deal. It's all for free. We want to connect these areas and create that. And this is a photo of us with the 200th uh, certified wildlife garden, which was just a few weeks back. So every backyard is important. So that's where you get, you know, we issued a number and, and a nice sign uh, and you'll be mapped out. And, and um, it's a really attempt to, to restore the ecology of the suburbia. Uh, what a concept, right? And look at New Jersey. Look, if you, if, if you live in, in uh, or, or bird in New Jersey, or lived in New Jersey, right? They make Jersey jokes all the time, but New Jersey is the place to be. If you love birds, there's very few places that are better than New Jersey, right? But number four or five and a number of bird species that you could see. So when somebody tells you, I'm going to Alaska to see birds, don't stay right here because you're gonna see more. So we're on Atlantic Flyway, that highway, that, that New Jersey Turnpike Garden State Parkway of migratory birds. It's a migration stopover, breeding areas. And right here in Bergen County, the most populous county, highly fragmented, is still a great, great area. Think about it. Think about all the areas we have even right here. Even right here in the county, you have the Meadowlands, you have the Hudson River, you have the Highlands area. In New Jersey, you go everywhere from High Point to Cape May. Cape May is one of the most credible birding places in, in, in the country, and the same with the Meadowlands. But what's in between becomes very, very important and, and means survival to so many of our species. And look, it benefits, you know, Audubon, you always think, a lot of times people say, well, what are you, what are you talking about butterflies? What are you talking about moths down? You're the Audubon Society. You're not, you're not supposed to talk about those. Then you're supposed to talk about birds, but we know it's all, it's all connected, right? So birds and butterflies can't reach signs. So if you make a good butterfly habitat, you know what? It's going to be pretty good bird habitat. And if you make some bird habitat, it's probably going to be good for butterflies too. Moths, bats, bees, butterflies, and in the end, people too. As well. So there's four elements, right? Four elements of any wildlife habitat, food, water, shelter, and nesting places. And that varies a lot depending on what species that you're trying to help. And we'll try to 
talk a little, little about them. So our ultimate goals, it should be our goals is to of course uh, increase the native plantings, that big word biodiversity that we have now, um, increase food and, and water source, sources, shelter opportunities, nesting opportunities, and decrease those non-native invasive plants, the lawn side, pesticide, herbicides, you know, it, it, you can't have one of these healthy habitats and be using pesticides and insecticides. And, you know, it's just, just not going to work. It's just not uh, helpful at all. So um, we have to really change the way that we think. Right. There's, there's a lot of folk, a lot of scientists that think the only way we're going to save migratory birds is to change the way that we guard it. And it's a whole different, whole different mindset. And, and, and it's not easy all the time of convincing people on why they should change and, 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 and how to change. And look, you know, it it's, it's, gets kind of scary too sometimes that you see a hole in a leaf and you want to go out and get some kind of like pesticides and insecticides to stop the thing that's making the hole in the leaf. But I'm here to tell you, that's the way we have to change thinking. When you see the holes in the leaves, that's a good thing. So as for, if you're creating a, a habitat, uh, especially bird habitat from the beginning, you would think of it as in layers. So there's birds that would like the top of the trees, some the lower canopy, some the shrub layer, and some in that in that ground layer, that meadow layer, if you were creating it uh, from scratch. But there's certainly no reason why you have to go that way. You now, a certified habitat could be a butterfly garden. It could be just a woodland garden. It could be all of those together. It could be anything, as long as the diversity of native plants is there. That's the foundation of a true healthy habitat is the number of, of, of native plants that you have. And that's what we're really looking for. That's what it all depends on. So why native plants? Again, I'm sure you guys know, but uh, no, they depend on them. The wildlife depends on them. They evolved with them for thousands of years, millions of years. They adapt better to our soils and climate. This is where they belong, right? So when you go plant a lawn, a traditional lawn, you got to lime the soil. And why do you got to lime the soil? Because you got to change the soil for a plant that doesn't belong here, right? So, so our, that's why our native plants just really do so well. And look, nobody's running out in the forest and, and fertilizing our, our native plants or doing anything. And, and once established, um, they they just do great. There's very little uh, care that has to be uh, done, and and you know and and it, it's survival. Look, it's really really survival to this wildlife. So there's four four native plant food groups for birds that, and some you may think of, and maybe some you won't. Right, fruits and berries, fruits and berries from native plants. You know, when I, sometimes uh, somebody is saying, well, Don, I see the uh, birds are eating all those porcelain berries. Yeah, but that's because it's the only thing they have to eat. And it's sort of like, you know, your kids eating uh, sugar uh, cereal all the time. Are they eating it? Yeah. Is it good for them? No. So the, the berries and the fruits from our native plants have the right nutritional value and get the berries at, at exactly the right time that our birds need them and the wildlife needs them. Nuts and seeds, same thing, very important, right? Nectar, right, for hummingbirds, very important. And what's the most important one? Uh, you guys know what the most important one is, insects. It's all about the insects. I don't care, almost, almost every single bird depends on those insects, high fat, high protein. That's what they're feeding their young. That's what they're growing on. That's what they're using to migrate. And if the plants aren't there that attract those insects, you know what? An area could look green and lush to the eye and be a desert when it comes to food sources for our birds and wildlife. Um, you know, that, that's, what they, that, that's what they need. That's what they need, that high fat, high protein from the insects, right? So look at that number of chickadees. Now, if you ever, if you're ever to watch uh, any nesting bird, whether it's an oriole, whatever it is, just watch, sit there and watch them one day, from sun up to sundown, insect after insect after insect, and that's what they need to to survive. If those insects aren't there, if those native plants aren't there to attract those insects, 
either they're not going to nest there at all, or they're not going to have a successful nest, or maybe even in a lose, lose the birds altogether. Um, so that decline that we talked about uh, in birds, so uh, it is because of the either the loss of habitat or the degradation of habitat due to things like invasive and non-native plants. Now, what's an invasive plant? I know, again, I'm preaching to the choir, don't you? but we have to just, just mention it. Um, and, and all these things, I hate even saying their names, okay? And this is just a few of them because we spend at Audubon um, a lot, a lot of time, a lot, a lot of time getting, trying to get rid of these things. And so when people say, oh, Don, I have my burning bushes, lovely, it doesn't go anywhere. Well, please come out with me during the summer and we'll find a lot of it to pull out for you if you think it doesn't go. And same with the barberry. And it's just uh, really awful stuff that's still sold at nurseries. I don't know why. Uh, but again, it's a total wasteland when it comes to our wildlife. Uh, disrupts the natural habitats. Again, there's there's no biodiversity. If you ever saw a habitat uh, totally covered with either porcelain berry, Japanese knotweed. I remember spending, I used to spend a lot of time up in the Delaware Water Gap uh, area. Um, and uh, I remember uh, not too many years ago being really appalled when I saw the whole area along the river uh, covered with Japanese barberry and privet hedge. Uh, it's just real, really sad. And what happens is those things will cause birds to nest lower in the canopy uh, than they would have, and they get predated on more by being lower in the canopy. So they, it's not only the food sources, it's what they do to the uh, environment altogether. So um, again, and then that causes the, our, our native species to be endangered. So uh, and this is the concept, you know, if something isn't eating your plants, then your garden is not part of the ecosystem. And again, that's a different different way of thinking. I know, look, if I would have told my old Italian grandmother that it's okay that something's eating the plants, she probably would have hit me over the head with her garden shovel or something. But but this is, uh, this is the way we have to change our, our thinking. And just to name, I would talk about some of the plants, but it, it's really diverse and just to show you how important it are, the wild cherry, 448 species of lepidoptomy, 448 species of moths and butterflies, uh, caterpillars will use that tree. Not even talking about how good the cherries are for the birds, um, but that food source for things like the scarlet tanager. Critical, as opposed to something like a ginkgo tree or, or a Bradford pear, which is zero. Wouldn't you have, want to have 448 different kinds of foods to choose from? There are none in the tree, but that, that's, what, that's what they do for us. And chewed leaves, again, are beautiful. Look at that American snout. I love that picture because of the holes in the leaves. That's cool. And that Canada warbler is probably eating the caterpillar of the American snout. But that's the way it works. And a world without insects is, is nothing. You'll, you'll, you know, it, it's the foundation of a real uh, true habitat. Now, you know, so much I know Douglas Ptolemy's book about oak trees uh, really brought it, it home for all of us. But, you know, um, years ago when we'd be out birding, we, we would look for an oak tree and we really didn't know why. We called it a magic tree. You know, we knew if there was a good oak tree stand somewhere, even in the middle of non-native trees, we were going to find some birds in that oak tree. So we used to say, find the magic tree. And now we know the magic tree is, is magic because of 517 species of lepidoptera will use that oak tree. Again, acorns are important, but it's really the insects that that oak tree holds. Even in the winter, when you see a little bird, a little kinglet on the branches of that oak tree, he's really actually eating little kind of insects that are on those branches that, that almost have a kind of antifreeze in them. So these are critical, critical trees. And you want to plant a tree, you know, you want to plant a single tree in the yard, you want to help wildlife, plant an oak tree. And these are just a list of some of the, as we go down the list of some of the most important trees that we have uh, that you could plant. And those warblers, those flying jewels, neo, jewels, neo tropical birds like the black or the green, chestnut warble really depend on those, those insects. Going lower in the canopy, service berry. I love service berry because I like to eat it. And so do the birds. So if you find a nice service berry in June, June berry is another name for it, 
sit under the trees, share the uh, berries with the birds like the rose-breasted grosbeak, and probably 40 other species of birds will be using that great little tree. Easy to get, easy to plant in the yard. Don't be doing that, uh, you know, those um, uh, uh, Bradford pears and those things that they want to sell you at the nursery. Ask them for a service berry. Same thing with our dogwoods, our native dogwoods, pagoda dogwood, flowering dogwood. Don't do that kusa dogwood, please. That thing is probably what gave our native dogwoods diseases. The berries get at the wrong time, they're big. The pagoda, I love the pagoda dogwood. That, that is really uh, tons of berries on it. Disease resistant, call it pagoda because kind of arms go out like a, like a pagoda. But the traditional flowering dogwood, great, great native plants. And you know what, I, we did a, we were doing a tour with some groups today um, over at Teaneck Creek and we got into a big discussion about how important the Eastern red cedars are, which people don't seem to use that much anymore, but they are just a, a great tree. Cedar, Eastern red cedar, cedar wax wings. You see how it's, how it's all connected. The cedar will give great nesting area, food source right through the winter, protection, um, you got it. Some of the shrubs, again, there's so many, you know, how, how do you pick your favorite? You know, somebody told me once trying to pick your favorite native plants, like trying to uh, pick your favorite kid, you know, that something great about every one of them. So uh, uh, American uh, elderberry, the witterod, viburnums. You try to plant something, you know, most of us are not lucky enough to have big expanses of property. But if you could plant, you know, a shrub, maybe it gets its berries in the summer, another one that holds it into fall or winter, that's a great idea if you could do that. Um, but any of them are good. You do what you can. I have berries for winter, things like the chokeberry. And a lot of folks tell me, and, and, and the same with uh, American holly, you know, they'll say, Don, I got these berries and you told me to plant them and I don't see the birds eating them. But usually these things, they don't like them much until it freezes. And then when it freezes, they get much sweeter. And then the birds like them. And it works out perfectly because in, in you know, late, late winter, um, you'll have the birds still finding berries, uh, like the hermit thrush, like the robins that you could find all winter long, feeding on hollies and things like chokeberries. Our native dogwood shrubs, like silky dogwood, red twig dogwoods, great shrubs, not only for the birds and the berries that it's, you know, our native plants don't really have one function in the environment, right? So dogwoods would, would be a host plant for the little uh, uh, Asia uh, butterflies, little blue butterflies, which are great. Um, and pollinators, right? We'll use those flowers and of course the berries. So uh, our native plants have much more function in the environment than, than a single one. And our native butterfly bush, don't want to plant butterfly. I know people love the butterfly bush. And look, on, on the invasive end of things, you know, it's probably not as invasive as some things are, but uh, there's really no reason to plant it. Plant our native butterfly bush, which is the button bush. Great uh, uh, nectar source. It's a magnet, really a magnet for pollinators and butterflies. And it can grow anywhere. You know, if you read about it, they're going to say it has to grow in water. Right, but it doesn't. It can grow in the water. It can grow in dry areas. Believe me, we introduce that plant everywhere, and and it's definitely tough. It stands up to the deer very well, uh, and it just smells beautiful. And I would urge everybody for the pollinators uh, to get a, a button bush, which are much easier to get now. And has that eastern tiger swallowtail on it. Um, probably the prime example of the perfect native plant would be a spice bush, right? So uh, spice bush, or they grow in sun, grow in shade. Um, they're male and female plants, right? So in the spring, they get little tiny yellow flowers, a lot like forsythia. So we don't want to plant forsythia. You want to plant the, uh, the spice bush. And they get berries with a high fat content, the female plant does, at high content in time for migration. So when the birds, like catbirds, and other birds are fattening up for fall migration, they have the spice bush all ready for them. Again, right, nutritional value, getting the food at the right time for things like the great crested, crested fly catcher and many others. And of course, the host plant for the spice bush swallowtail butterfly. Can you get any more perfect than that? Right? Can't, can't get any better than that. 
right? Going to the ground where we can go on and on, the Agastache, the hyssop. I love for the pollinators, but if you look at the picture over to the side, you'll see the goldfinches eating the seed from it in, in the fall. So, and don't cut down your plants. Don't, don't want to do that. Uh, going to keep them up. Um, to let things like the goldfinches and many migratory birds are still in our in our habitat projects are still feeding on all those flower heads uh, that are in our garden. All right, the Joe Pye weed, of course, you know, if you're just learning about this stuff, many of our native plants have the name weed on them. Joe Pye weed, iron weed, milkweed, all those weeds are good. All right, and milkweed in every yard. So let me, let me say so that's swamp milkweed and that's my arm in, in, in case you're curious, but so um, the monarch, monarch butterfly um, is on the endangered species list of some science groups, um, but not um, on our government. It's not recognized by our government as an endangered species. U.S. Fish and Wildlife has not put it on the list. And why didn't they put it on the list? Well, it's political, right? The farmers would have to you know, sacrifice their pesticides and insecticides. They they wouldn't be able to cut down the milkweed. And so the government doesn't want to interfere with them or their lobbying efforts. So they don't add it to the endangered species. Let's go if they do that, they have to do something. But, and, and the traditional problem with the monarchs was in the Midwest, right? Midwest where, the, where we had, one time those built big milkweed fields, have been compromised by uh, genetically engineered crops. Farmers able to spray, spray round up everywhere and kill more milkweed. But now that population has shifted more in our region to the Eastern part of the United States. And why do they have done that? Because there's more milkweed. And that wasn't the government doing it. That was you and me and everybody else in small groups of planting milkweed. So that that this species that's hanging on is because of what people like that are here right tonight have done. Uh, and now that big part of that migratory population in the fall is coming right through Cape May from from the northeast, uh, from Canada right right through Cape May uh, down to Mexico to make it that far. So so don't ever think that what you do is meaningless or can have an effect. Because my opinion, we we saved this butterfly and uh, still continue to do it. Should it be added to the endangered species list? Absolutely. Will it? I don't know. But um, but I know what none of us are waiting to see uh, if it is or not. We're all doing what we can. And this is uh, this is always a challenge for me. This is me working with the uh, uh, New Jersey DLT, stopping them from cutting down milkweed in areas and. Uh, not an easy thing to do, and uh, it's uh, it's challenging to say the least. But in this case here, we did manage to keep this uh, milkweed bed up this year. But it's yeah, always vigilant. You're always again learning, learning to change the way we garden, learning to, for the state to learn the, what they should be doing and how they should be protecting. The monarch and other butter. This is that. This is something they could do easily. They, you know, all we're really asking them is to not do something, right? We're not asking them to plant even plant milkweed. We're asking them not to mow the milkweed, <laughs> and that gets a much tougher than you think sometimes. But we're certainly giving it an effort, and and we're work, we're doing better. And this is why we need the milkweed, of course. Uh, monarchs and that milkweed is just coming out of the ground that's probably just a few inches tall and the monarchs are already uh, laying eggs on it this spring uh, more of our native wildflowers of course new york ironweed great nectar source of wildflower and the cardinal flower my god if you have cardinal flower you're going to find hummingbirds i don't i don't care where you are they are just going to find you keep the golden rod up this is one of the things that we always work the hardest to convey to people those monarchs are migrating south in the fall. One of the last flowers they have are the goldenrods, and people tend to cut them down. Um, we've got to keep them up. It's the whole, there's a whole number of, of uh, uh, insect species that depend on the goldenrod. That's not what you're allergic to. People think that that's the algae is usually the ragweed. Um, 
but keep those golden, grow those golden rods. There's so many different species of golden rod that, that are great for the garden, uh, great for the backyard. Um, and, and they're beautiful, right? And you're serving just a great function. You're saving so many species of, of pollinators and butterflies by planting goldenrod. And the other one is the asters, right? The asters, most important, aster, people, people put in uh, other flowers in the fall, and stuff, but the asters are incredible. And they're also the host plant for that little pearl crescent butterfly. Um, those are the two four, those are the two most important flowers, especially in late summer or fall that you could have in the garden. And of course, bee balm, monarda, again, great for hummingbirds, another hummingbird magnet. Uh, and our vines too, right? Trumpet vine. Uh, I know people, it gets tough. So it may not be for every backyard. It tends to grow wild. But if you got the room for it, the Baltimore Orioles love, it. hummingbirds love it, but the Orioles love the trumpet vine. They'll poke the holes and instead of hovering like a hummingbird does, they're getting back in that flower and poke a hole in it and drink the nectar from it. And not only the Baltimore Oreo, the Orchard Oreo too. And what do we get? The trumpet vine moth, right? So you see how, how these native plants uh, work their magic in so many different ways. Uh, Virginia creeper, people wanna cut down Virginia creeper, great berry source for the birds. Our native honeysuckle, don't plant the Japanese honeysuckle, you'll be sorry. Native Lanocera sempervirens, native honeysuckle, great. But that Virginia creeper, what do we got there? The Virginia creeper sphinx moth, right? There we go. So you eliminate these plants from the environment, you eliminate wonderful creatures like that also. And that's actually, uh, that, that uh, moth is in my hand. Uh, Dutchman's pipe, a pipe vine is one of those great examples on how people have helped bring back the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. Um, the pipe vine, the Dutchman's pipe, uh, was grown on porches and people's homes for years. Porches fell out of favor, so did the pipe vine uh, swallowtail. But in recent years, people have been planting it more and more, and they've been bringing back uh, the pipe vine swallowtail butterflies, creepy little wild looking caterpillar. Uh, but that's our babies, uh, beautiful. Plant the pipe vine, Dutchman's pipe. Absolutely. Our native grasses, right? Don't plant those. Non-native uh, invasive grasses, horrible. Switch our native grasses are so beautiful. And things like our so sparrows, song sparrows, many of the sparrow species depend on those grasses, and so do our butterflies. Believe it or not, you don't think of grasses as butterfly-friendly uh, 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 plants, but things like the Delaware skipper, broken, there's many of those little skipper butterflies depend on those grasses to lay their eggs on. Don't have those native grasses. We don't have these species. So when people tell you, and I get all the time, Don, I don't see uh, the butterflies like I did when I was a kid. I don't see the birds. I don't see pollinators. What happened? What happened is you changed the way that you garden. You change it to native plants, uh, non-native plants that are, are, are wildlife can't use and don't recognize. And look, 94% of moth caterpillars pupae in the ground and leaf litter, I know, I sound like a broken record. Don't rake up those leaves. Leave them where you can. We could do a whole program on why those leaves are important. And these are just some of the creatures that, again, Don, I don't see the lightning bugs. I don't see the lunar moth. I don't see the brown thrashers like I used to. Well, you're raking them away. This is what you're doing every year. So don't do that. And bird feeders, you know, people ask me about bird feeders in the habitat, not necessarily, not necessarily for any certification not really necessary for your habitat. If you like to have them, that's good, but maintain them, keep them clean, keep the seed fresh, keep the ground clean, and, and they're okay. And habitats are beautiful, right? And so I don't want you to think they could be wild and crazy and you have to have a jungle. No, they could be just as beautiful just using the beneficial native plants. So some basic organic fertilizers only if you need them. Uh, no pesticides, improve the soil, compost, leave the leaves, organic mulch. So organic, basic to easy stuff, right? Uh, and <laughs> don't be this guy. You know, don't be this guy. I, you know, if you, I'm probably the last person you want to cry to about your groundhogs and squirrels because they're just part of the deal, right? Just part of, just part of so You have to learn to get along with them. They're great creatures and, and just as great as, as any other. Now, water too. You got to provide some water uh, if you can. Um, you think about it. A kid growing up, everybody played in a neighborhood pond, a stream. 
And where are those places now? Not around my neighborhood anyway, they're just not there anymore. So any clean source of water could be little tray, doesn't have to be fancy. Uh, anything for them to drink shallow source of water is really great. And if you do a pond or garden, make sure you do it with native plants. Same thing, create that little uh, micro habitat in your yard. Think shallow, gently sloping. You don't want birds to drown in it, please. Rock, put rocks on the sides, oxygenate it, native plants, and if you create a whole magical stopover point for migratory birds. And this is the one I always have. Boy, I was uh, really on some people the other day uh, um, in, in the county about keeping up these trees. Now, everybody wants, everything's a hazard, everything's a liability, everything is this. We want to keep up those dead snags. Many birds are cavity nesters, like our woodpeckers, nuthatches, screech owls, chicken. We can go on and on. So keep up some of those. Obviously, we don't want a tree falling on your house or falling on your neighbors. But if you can keep some of that dead snag up, right? Keep eight feet of it, 10 feet of it, whatever it is, it's really going to help. And provide nest boxes. You know, there's a housing shortage in New Jersey, not only for people, but for birds too. So we could really help them that and that picture on the left is a house wren using a nest box and the other side is a downy woodpecker that's not nesting in it he's using it for winter so it's like a winter rental he's getting in there and he's throwing out the sticks that that the house wren put in in the spring because he doesn't want any sticks in there when he spends the winter in he'll leave and go somewhere else to nest because they like making holes and then usually things like the house wrens or tree swallows and whoever move in the box so Put nest boxes up in different sizes and keep them up all year. Very important to helping the birds. And even things like robins, little shelves, right? And don't forget the bats. That's a big part of the ecosystem and they're in trouble too. And you can go to uh, audubon.org plants uh, for birds and you can actually, <coughs> excuse me, put in your own, um, that's pokeweed by the way. Uh, put in your zip code and it'll give you a list of plants that's good for your region. And look, it's just, again, we're not only doing it for the birds and wildlife, we're doing it for us. Great. If you can go out into your backyard or wherever and, and connect with nature, you know, that's the biggest danger that we have. And people always ask me, what's the biggest? Is the climate change the worst thing? Is it habitat loss? What is it done? And I say, it's the disconnect. That's the thing that scares me more than anything, because unless I can teach you, uh, get you to love nature and connect with it, why in the world would you care about doing anything about climate change? Why would you care about doing anything about saving habitat? So the best thing that any organization could do is connect people with nature. And not only kids, not only kids, but grownups do need that connection too. And the more we can teach people, the more we can get them to love nature, the more we're going to get them to care for it. Uh, in the end. So um, to create a Bergen County Audubon Certified Wildlife Garden, uh, and you can go to our website, you can email me uh, for any information. Again, it's all free, um, doesn't cost you anything. Um, some of our, uh, this is the first school that we had certified uh, a few years back when we started the program. This is in Saddlebrook uh, Middle High School. Uh, and some places that you can go and visit. Uh, we have great uh, butterfly and hummingbird gardens up at the New Jersey Botanical Gardens, uh, which is just uh, where we'll be on Sunday, actually, for Walk Teaneck Creek. We have a, a lot going on at Teaneck Creek. Um, that's been a great restoration project by the county, but we started years ago restoring our own areas in there. This is part of our butterfly garden. We have uh, native bird garden there too. So that's a great place to visit. And you can do that tours with us if I want to. Of course, you know, I'm a Meadowlands kid. Uh, it's all about the Meadowlands. The Court Park is really, really an amazing place. Uh, that's even gotten better and better over years. And that's where, yet, where we have Butterfly Day and Native Plant Day every year. Uh, so visit there. And one of the places that we're most proud of is our Overpeck Garden near the Equestrian Center. That area was restored by whether well, that there was nothing but frags and knotweed and porcelain berry and every other worst things that we could have and we set this up as a learning area as as uh, a place for kids and families and of course a habitat for butterflies and pollinators and it really is uh, 
It's one of my favorite places in the whole world to visit. Uh, of all the paths you're taking, right? Make sure that some of them are dirt. And that's our um, one of our signs that you get. And as a plug for my book, uh, buy my book. It's cheap. It's only, it's only five bucks. And uh, I hope you enjoy that. And we got some things coming up. Uh, this Saturday at the court, we have our awards day and meeting over at the Environmental Center. So, um, in fact, we're giving a, uh, two people uh, that have won our um, conservation award. Uh, it's because of the work they've done at that over Pet Garden. So, come out and join us. Uh, Eagle Fest is January 15th, um, which is a great fun day in the Meadowlands. And please join Bergen County Audubon. Thank you. And I'll stop sharing. And do you have any, any questions or anything that you like? Thank you so much, Don. That was really, really great. Such an engaging lesson. Really, really appreciate um, you sharing with us. And thank you so much for being here. Um, we do have some questions. Um, so we're really appreciative of you taking the time to explain a lot of things um, that you know have gotten answered a little bit. Um, so we're going to take the time now um, until about 7.50 to uh, answer some of these questions. And so thank you guys again for all participating and sharing your, um, you know, your questions. Uh, we will be combining some questions to make sure everybody's thoughts are heard as well. So if you have questions, please feel free to continue to add them to the chat or into the Q&A. Um, we'll try to get through as many as possible here. Um, so hopefully each response could be about three-ish minutes, but, you know, please expand as much as you need to. Um, we are going to start with the first question, um, which was a quick and easy one um, from Lynn. They asked, even though it's Bergen County Audubonist Society, will they also certify in uh, Hudson County as well? Oh, yeah, we, we certify everywhere. Like I said, we have yards certified in Missouri and Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, anywhere you like the moon, wherever you want. As long as you got those native plants, we're ready to, to certify. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, uh, Hudson County, we ha have a lot of certified yards there already. So uh, yeah, happy to, ha happy to have you. That'd be great. Amazing. That's super, super great to hear. Um, so the next question is, uh, what are some of the challenges for creating a native garden garden in an urban area, such as a small space, um, less than six hours of sunlight, you know, what are the, the top, you know, plants that you would recommend for small spaces and, you know, navigating those challenges with a smaller garden? Yeah, I think that, you know, it, it would depend on the sunlight that you have. And, and I would say the first thing is not to worry about being a plant collector, right? Go with a few plants that work. Um, don't worry about many as you were worried about being functional being more important so i would definitely have some milkweed in there um i would uh, definitely have things like again dependent on the space joe pie weed very important some goldenrod some asters um they'll work work very well um if you have any kind of trellis at all maybe some native honeysuckle in there i have look let me tell you something that i have a very very small yard you'd be happy to know that my planting area is an industrial area of Munaki in the meadowlands and my planting area is maybe 15 feet wide and at most 50 feet long and I've had over 80 species of birds. I get hummingbirds. So I, if I can do it, you know, anybody can do it, you know. And when I first started doing this many years ago, I had no idea that, you know, I say, well, I, I'm plant some of this stuff. And, you know, if something good happens, let me tell you, it's like turning on a light in a dark room, right? It just it seems that these creatures are just waiting somewhere. You put in these native plants and, and they just show up. I don't know how they show up, I don't know, but they just find them. And, and it's so, I don't care how small you are or how big you are, you can do it. You can really do this. If you only had a patio, use planters for these native plants. You, 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 you know, it, it, it's just, again, amazing. You will be amazed on what a difference you can make in such a small area. 
That totally makes sense. And just to, to follow up real briefly on that question as well, um, let's say somebody doesn't have a garden, like a physical garden space. Is there any like terrace things that you would recommend, things that would grow well above ground as well? Windowsills? Yeah, like like oh, windowsill? Yeah, well, you know, it depends on, you know, in pots, many native plants are really hardy and they do well in pots. Um, you know, um, again, I've experimented a lot with that because of my limited space. So if you want to go grow milkweed in a planter, It'll work. It'll work. You know, uh, so don't don't be don't be afraid to try. Don't don't be afraid to that you could adapt these things. You don't have to worry about there's some giant expanse. You know, and look, if I if I didn't have a small yard and have tried this myself, I I probably wouldn't believe it. I would say, what well, you know, really, you know, but it works and, and you could do it. Uh, no matter, but yeah, start a, 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 a you know, get some pots, put in any you can put anything you want in them and, and it'll work. It'll work. Yes, as long as you're giving it that tender love and care, right? Taking right. care of it and taking care yep. of the species around it. Yep. Um, so next question, um, I actually was thinking of this one. Um, do certified wildlife habitats get protected by the law, such as if somebody moves away from their wildlife garden, are developers legally allowed to change the space and the plants that are there? Uh, unfortunately, yes, they could really do it. So it's really just a a, um, a um, certification by us as as a recognition of your yard. Believe me, I wish that was the case, but you know I could even go into a, a, a state park and it's not safe for anybody. So um, you know, uh, um, you know, I but there was a lot of people that uh, I know that sold their homes with certified yards that that. Ask the the new owners to keep up with it and protect it, but uh, but no, that that's totally up to you how how it goes. So, yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, you know, it, investing in the community camaraderie of you know it, the space itself and making sure yeah. that you know it, each other can take care of it long term. Yeah. Um, I definitely have those concerns. But as you were saying earlier during your presentation, I was really helpful to hear. You know, it's it is. You know, it is a constant um, keeping people accountable for protecting, you know, like the huge milkweed space that you guys ended up saving. Um, and that's really inspiring to see because people are becoming more aware of what is necessary. So hopefully in the future, we will have those laws in place to be able to, you know, protect our land um, the way that they deserve to be protected. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, go ahead. No, oh, it's good. Go ahead. Okay, so the next question we have here, um, as we all know, we love the phrase, leave the leaves. And um, as you know, the, you know, it is kind of a controversial thing because of social norms and because of the way that we um, see spaces as being dirty, but they're just outside and their nature and the natural processes. So um, any comments about leave the leaves and like, if we don't rake the leaves, is it safe to remove, when is it safe to remove them in the spring or do we leave them? What, what is the process? I would say, I, I understand where, you know, where people are coming from, why they're hesitant, but I, I would try to leave them at least in one part of the yard, right? So yeah, you know, neighbors are going to look at you funny. You know, if you leave them all over your lawn, I mean, try to cut down on the lawn in the first place, but just pick a spot where you can leave some leaves that you can, you know, and then just just leave them. I mean, I, I guess there's no great time to to remove them. There isn't a more safer time. You definitely want to leave them in the winter. In the spring, the birds will be looking for insects in them. So see if you could just devote a small part of your of your yard to that, um, to leave it, leaving the leaves in there. Yeah. I know it's different and it's different way of thinking and different way of doing things, but, you know, and it, it doesn't, you know, just, just um, do what you can. That's what I would say. Do what you can. Could you imagine if everybody uh, just, uh, just, just think of your block, you know, next time you're outside and look down your block. And if you have, a uh, uh, native plant garden, then just imagine if everybody up your block, up the street did the same thing. And then imagine if everybody in your net, you would live in a totally different neighborhood, a totally different environment. Imagine that, imagine birds and butterflies like all around you. And it's not, 
it's not too far to think about, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we can do. And what I love that, you know, it's, it should be empowering, right? So this is something we could do. I, I don't got to write to the governor or write to the president or ask Congress to pass a law. This is something that we could all do today. So when we're down and looking at those 3 billion birds lost and we're down hearing about how bad the monarchs are doing, well, damn, we could do something. We as individuals could do something, you know, and, and that is should be totally empowering and that should make us really feel good at what we can do. So um, to follow up on the question about, you know, where to leave the leaves, um, is there any like particular, you're saying like reserve a spot in your garden, um, Lynn is uh, explaining that, you know, when she has them over the bulbs that the bulbs are not able to get oh, the, the sunlight yeah. and the nutrients they need. Right, are there any right. spaces that you would say, absolutely, you should totally put them here. This would be the best spot for I, it. I think if you have oak trees, you definitely want to leave them under the oak trees because you have many species of overwintering butterflies um that will use those uh like the hair streak butterflies will overwinter in that leaf litter under the oaks so that's a great place to leave them but again you know leave them where you can around the bottoms of those native trees you know you don't you don't want to create giant piles around them you don't have to do that but just leave a layer of leaves each year around around especially around those native big trees which is really really helpful and they'll Thank find you. them yeah. Thank you for the insight. Now that's super, super helpful. And if anybody has any extra leaves, like way too many leaves, um, you know, there is always um, the ability to compost them. We have a lot of municipal compost locations yeah. throughout Hudson County and some in um, Bergen County as well. So um, I'll include the link here um, as we're continuing on to the next question. Um, but yeah, so compost if you can, if you want to. Yeah. Um, so another question has just been brought up. Um, I want to appeal, Kathleen says, to the developers here in Jersey City to plant responsibly. How do we do that um, and be taken seriously and get things actually moving forward and get them to landscape with native plants you mean you know yeah I, you know it, it that, that should be mandatory that that should be a given that any any new development they should be made to landscape with native plants um i you know i, I would approach them as, as an organization you know through an organization to approach you know a new developer wants to be friendly towards the community and neighborhood i mean ultimately it should be a a, a city ordinance you know, but but otherwise, I think the uh, your society, you know, any group could go to them and say, look, this is what we're asking you to do to improve the neighborhood. And, you know, you, you might be surprised on on uh, what you get back. So um, of their reaction, uh, certainly no guarantee on how they react. But I think I think that's a good way to approach it. Friendly, you know, can you do this? This is why we, we like you to do it. And I, I think it may it, it, it might work. Yeah, um, just to speak briefly, uh, Kathleen, I actually do um, a lot of conversing with like Union City um, and North Bergen about planting more responsibly and to give a, you know, um, motivation um, that in North Bergen, they've agreed to plant only native trees from now on. Um, they have a very robust planting program when it comes to their trees. So, um, just go up to your your officials and and you know present something that really makes you happy and passionate and uh, I think if as long as you're putting yourself out there it would really it it shows that you care and that people care and they're willing to also um, put in that work and care as well. Yeah. 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 And uh, Tammy says also try to appeal to your town's environmental commission um, or shade tree commissions who may encourage the um, native planting. Yep. Yeah. It's a learn, you know, everybody has to learn. And it, and as things go, it's still new to a lot of groups and folks, but, you know, it, it just need something willing, somebody willing to learn. Absolutely. Um, so to kind of take a, a little bit of a different route, just because, you know, you have your book, Life in the Meadowlands, and I'll include the link again in a moment. Um, when it comes to the Meadowlands itself, what is being done about the invasive species in the Meadowlands? Um, do they remove, uh, when do they remove invasive species and do they replant natives? Who is taking care of like the native species, the invasive species problem in um, the Meadowlands particularly? 
Uh, it would depend on on where exactly in the Meadowlands, because the Meadowlands is pretty vast. But in in those parks, like the Court Park, um, they do a really really great job of uh, of uh, doing their best to remove. Of course, invasives are tough, but uh, so over the years, uh, Gabrielle uh, uh, Meany, who was uh, the land. Um, uh, the person in charge of the landscapes there have been doing an incredible job of planting natives and controlling the invasives and 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 Bergen Audubon has probably stuck fifty or sixty thousand dollars over the years into the court park, but we wouldn't do that without somebody like Gabrielle who actually knows a business and knows what to do. You know, you you're talking about uh, and, and just the court park in in uh, for instance. Back when the park was made 40 years ago, 50 years, native plants were kind of a new concept and there wasn't much available, right? And <clears throat> what's interesting is that it's built on a landfill. So they didn't know how much the methane uh, would bother the plants. And, and so now uh, over the years, uh, they've been getting rid of the non-native and invasive plants that are there and replacing with the natives. And that's one reason we have like Butterfly Day, Butterfly Day there uh, in places like, and the same goes for like Mill Creek Marsh. Now, some places in the Meadowlands aren't controlled by, you know, the it, it, it's the NGSEA now, which is the former New Jersey Meadowlands Commission. Some places like Laurel Hill County Park, which are in the Meadowlands, but run by the county. So it really depend on which park and 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 um, and what you know what who we're dealing with and who's taking care of it. But you know we certainly try to keep tabs on everything in Meadowlands. That's kind of our home base, and uh, uh, I love it. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for putting in the, you know, the effort for the Bergen County Audubon Society and yourself specifically, Don Torino, for putting in the effort to make sure that our um, Meadowlands is being revitalized with what, um, you know, what should have been there in the first place, right? All of this yeah. amazing, um, these amazing plants that are communities not just um not just our birds and our our insects and our butterflies and etc they um it's also you know for us and our our happiness and the the thriving of our our own um existence so that's super great um i have another question here and feel free anybody else who has any more questions um right now this is the last question but if anybody else has anybody any other questions we will add them in um so, you know, we were talking a little bit about um, the nutritional values of um, different, you know, species, and especially with the invasive species being around here, is there a difference in the value that, um, you know, let's say nutritional value of uh, native berries versus the nutritional value of non-native berries? What, um, is there any difference or is it, you know, yeah, can give can you give us an explanation? Yeah, like the porcelain berry, which is so prominent, the, the studies on the nutritional value of the porcelain berry is very, very poor compared to most of the native berries. So while the birds are eating, you know, that's what people say, well, the birds are eating them, yeah, and they're eating them because there's nothing else to eat because the porcelain berry is around everything. So, you know, given a choice, they're going to they're gonna take those, those native berries. So, um, so that, again, the native plants are getting those that fruits and berries and nuts at exactly the right time, whether it's springtime, whether it's fall migration, and it's the right nutritional value, such as the spice bush and high fat content for fall migration. Um, and those those uh, you know those non-natives which are invasive, which you know just but there's no more biodiversity. There's only a, a, a monoculture. There's not much left there. They're going to try to survive the best way they can. So, so the native berries and fruits and always have better, a butterfly bush. Even look at that. The butterfly bush, they compare it now to uh, a kid drink, drinking sugary Coke all day as compared to something like the button bush. So do the butterflies use it? Yeah. Is it good for them? Probably not. So, you know, that that's where we are with, uh, you know, with, with the non-natives and invasives. Um, to further ask about non-natives um, invasives, um, such as like 
when it comes to trees like the Bradford pear um, and these invasive trees that, you know, um, are cheaper, um, they're more easily accessible. What what is the what are the problems with, you know, obviously besides the fact that our birds and our, our insects and all of these creatures and ourselves don't benefit from it? Are there any other like hazards or things that come with planting non-native trees or well, it, well, it but some are invasive. Some will grow like uh, wild, just like any in like like porcelain berries. So they're going to create their own monoculture too, um, and which will choke out any of the native trees too. So the danger, you know, is is just not uh, creating not again. The area could be green and lush and look beautiful to the eye and be a total wasteland. You know, so do you want to sit among trees with no life in them or do you want to, you know, uh, you want to really hurt the environment? That's that's what you can do. You know, it, it's, you know, really, it's, it's a decision that you can make, but it's an important decision that everybody has to make to uh, whether they're going to do a favor, help the earth a little bit or just plant something because the landscape, it tells them it's a good idea. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, it's it's hard to have that knowledge uh, readily available. And I also wanted to mention, you know, uh, besides this amazing webinar, which will be on our YouTube channel that you guys, you know, if you need to refer back to it, we will also save the chat. Um, uh, you know, it's hard to, to know what native, what plants are native and where you can find them, where you can buy them. Um, you know, keep an eye on our page, the, the Wild Ones um, Gateway page. Um, let me share the link in a second. But, you know, we are an open resource that you can reach out to us anytime, especially um, if you do end up becoming a member. Um, if you have uh, the ability to do so, we can offer one-on-one -on -one support in finding the, um, the native plants that suit you the best. Um, I wanted to ask another question um, that came up in the chat about poison ivy and that obviously it's very important to the birds, but of course it's scare, scary for us. Is there any native alternative that you would recommend that can replace that plant? Well, you know, it's not, there's other good vines like the Virginia creeper is excellent. Um, they don't, don't really replace it because each one of those plants has their special niche. But if you wanted a good vine that was uh, that was good for the birds, um, that that the Virginia creeper, which grows everywhere, you know, is, is a good one. Um, it, you know, if you could keep up a, some of that, that obviously, you know, if you don't want poison ivy, if it's you know you're going to touch it around your team, you got kids and you're going to go touch it. But again, if there's somewhere that you could leave it alone. You know, if, if you ever uh, saw uh, yellow rump warblers, which are really beautiful little warbler, well, nine times out of 10, if you see them all fluttering around a plant or tree, it's it's poison ivy. They love poison ivy berries, just love them. But, and you know, if it's not safe, you don't have to keep it where it's not safe. But um, if you can keep some of it up, it's a good idea. But if you want a good vine with berries, I think Virginia creeper would do the trick. Amazing. Thank you. Um, to continue asking, I got two more questions. Um, first question being, um, are there any other ground covers? Because um, Gisela mentions here that the Virginia creeper is also being used as a ground cover. Are there any other better ground covers than just, you know, plain old grass? Any, any I don't know. You know, I'm not really into ground covers so much. I'm not, you know, I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I'm going to put plants down and perennials and to think of the traditional little ground cover that grows kind of crazy. I, I don't know. I'm just not, just not my thing. So, um, you know, if, if, if it's a shady area, I would look at creating like a woodland garden, like putting in things like, like wood asters. And if you have uh, wet areas, um, things like may apple, it's really cool to have. So, uh, I, I'm not really into putting ground covers for the sake of ground covers, um, but I, I think I'd rather have more diverse plants that will act as ground covers in their own right. Um, Lynn asked, uh, clover is usually a good ground cover, right? Just in, just in case people want ground covers. Um, it's a native clover? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. 
Uh, mountain mint's a good, good one. Uh, mountain mint will cover some ground for you. That's an amazing plant. Many different kinds of mountain mint. In there. Yeah. Okay, last question for you. Um, specifically, this has to do with the Meadowlands. Um, you know, there's this one plant that is super invasive all over the place. And I just wanted to ask, do you know if the frogmite Fragmites. Fragmites. Yeah. Oh, boy, that's a that's a loaded question. So the Fragmites are never going to go away. In areas, they, they are being controlled. And and a, a good example of that is the Richard P. Kane area uh, along in Kallstadt, uh, Munaki area. So, so what they've done is originally uh, dug them out and even in some cases sprayed. And then you you lower you lower the bank that Phragmites can't grow under the water, so uh, you let the water level come up, and then it's a good uh, 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 environment for the Spotina grasses, the native grasses to grow. Uh, in some cases, the the frags uh, are, are beneficial to some species if they're not out of control in an area. Things like uh, the bitterns, the least bitterns will breed in those areas, so. Um, that's one we're going to have to live with and learn how to control to eliminate it, not without a nuclear weapon, and then it would probably come back. You know? <laughs> oh, wow. Well, thank you so, so much, Don. We really, really appreciate all of your insights. This has been such an amazing webinar. If anybody wants to react, please, yes, claps in the chat, reactions. Thank you so much, um, Don. We really, really appreciate it. Um, do you have any closing statements before I pass it on to Carol? No, just come out and join us on a walk and, and you know, you don't have to register this. Come out and, and join us and, and we'll show you all around the Meadowlands and, and have some fun together. Thank you and I appreciate it. Amazing. Thank you, Don. I am going to pass it on to Carol for our closing statements. Great. Thank you so much, Don, for your very engaging presentation. Um, lots of interest, lots of mentions in the chat and um i think we have inspired many new people to the value of native plants um we will definitely be using your guiding inspiration as we move forward with our wild ones mission 